A very warm welcome and good evening, everyone. Great to have you here with us today. And my name is Kira Stagg, and I'm part of the alumni relations team here at Trinity Development and Alumni. Um, it's great to have you here for the latest episode of Inspiring Ideas at Trinity Series. Our webinar this evening has been produced in partnership with Trinity Sport, and we are really looking forward to hearing the stories behind the successes of our two alumni panelists, as well as a fun and lively discussion on how, how sport shapes and inspires individuals. We'll also be talking about how these communities impact social change. So before introducing our speakers, I just have a few things to note. This webinar will be just under an hour. The talk itself will be around 35 minutes, after which we'll open the floor to audience questions. To submit a question, simply use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We encourage as much audience interaction as possible. You're welcome to pop questions in throughout the webinar as you think of them. I'd also like to note that we're using Zoom generated automatic subtitles for this webinar. If you'd like to see the transcription, click the three dots at the bottom of the screen and click view full transcript. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on our Trinity Alumni YouTube channel. I'd like to introduce you now to our speakers. Jack Dunn is a professional rugby player playing with the Executor Chiefs in England. He studied theoretical physics at Trinity and represented Dublin University Football Club between 2017 and 2022. During his time at DUFC, he helped the club to an All-Ireland Under-20 win. And earlier this year, he was awarded the University Pinks, the highest sporting award Trinity can bestow. While playing for Leinster, he came out publicly as bisexual. He is currently the only openly LGBTQ player in the Gallagher Prem Premiership. Nicole Owens is a Dublin senior football player, a four-time All-Ireland champion and an advocate for positive mental health and self-acceptance. Finally, I'd like to welcome our MC for this evening, Mara Therese, and a co colleague. Mara Therese is an award-winning sports broadcaster from County Galway. She began her media career in Radio Nagualtoch, and after there, has presented from programmes to TG Cahar, RTE, Off the Ball Podcast, Sky Sports, Ear Sport, and BBC on Northern Ireland, to name a few. She is also a Sport Ireland accredited sports psychologist and is currently working as a medical doctor. Enjoy the webinar, and now over to our panellists. For Mila Mahad Kira, thanks so much for that. Um, that just makes me sound like I'll work for anyone. So <laughs> I mean, I, I like to say that I'm not as promiscuous as my CV makes me seem. But listen, um, it's been a great pleasure to partner again with Trinity Sport for this webinar. And as Kira so eloquently outlined there, Trinity recently launched the Realizing Potential, a strategy for sport and physical activity at Trinity with the mission to inspire, engage and connect everyone through sport in an inclusive and supportive environment, which echoes tonight's webinar theme. And in this episode of our Inspiring Ideas at Trinity series, we examine how sport and leadership intersect to influence our culture and impact social change. And as we know, sport has long been a platform for addressing questions like power, gender, race. It's a powerful tool that brings people together in a really safe way to develop connections that transcend language and cultural barriers. And as we know as well, recently, political, cultural, humanitarian and health pressures have challenged the sports community to rethink, I suppose, their role and the power that sport has within uh, society. I'm delighted to welcome our, our Lumini panellists, as we uh, were outlined already there, Jack Dunn, Exeter Chiefs rugby player, and Nicole Owens, Dublin GA player, on how sport shapes and inspires individuals and communities and helps influence culture and impact social change in a good way as well. Now, I know a lot of people here probably already know you two quite well, but I think to both of you, and I might throw this question to Jack first, because I think when we see people like Jack and Nicole and what you've all achieved, it's so amazing, but like it's really out of reach for the normal Joe Soaps. But like at one point, you two were also normal Joe Soaps kicking a ball. So what got you both involved in your chosen sport? And I'll start with you first, Jack. Oh, I think I've been playing rugby since I was about four or five. So um always loved watching it on the TV growing up and then started playing and never stopped really. So yeah, just it was pretty much been part of my life for as long as I can rem remember. So I don't really know what got me started. Just, just the love of it, basically. Exactly, yeah. And yourself, Nicole, probably similar, you're going to say. Yeah, completely similar. I think, again, I started playing golf when I was also four or five and went up to the nursery and haven't stopped since. I think mean, just loved all sport. Um, and Gal was the one that won out in the end. I, and to ask a silly question, because I'm thinking back to when I was four or five and I also loved football. I always had a football under my arm and I was playing, but 
what do you think, what is the difference, Nicole, say, between you who went on and achieved what you did and me who, I'm sure some people, if they were eavesdropping, they'd say she couldn't kick snow off a rope, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? What, what, is, what is that extra ingredient that, the, that the, the likes of yourself and other professional athletes have to go as far as you have? But I'm unlike Jack. I'm not a professional athlete. Well, you're you're elite. Still an amateur athlete. But you're e- elite. I, I refuse to accept that you're elite. You're living the life. <laughs> um, God, I don't know. That's that's a, that's a tough one. Never having seen you played. <laughs> so it wasn't great. You never saw um, me in a maroon jersey. There's a reason for it. That's why I'm in the Galway Ladies backroom team because I wasn't great with the actual football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think I just always loved it and have been lucky that kind of all my way up had really good kind of coaches and mentors that helped me develop as a player and then was given opportunities as well. Um, right from underage to kind of be part of a pipeline where you know we were developed and that's kind of really important at a young age to have some structure and it's great now seeing like the amounts that there is there and investment in underage players I think Jack that's a really good point isn't it it goes to show that not that I'm saying I was amazingly talented but I'm sure there's lots of kids around the country who had amazing talent that weren't picked up but it's because of those structures around you be it family or community or club that helps develop the young kids into people like you guys are today yeah absolutely you can't do it by yourself you need you know, a whole team of people you know, driving you to train and making you dinner, giving you the best coaching. You know, you need a bit of luck just to get picked for certain teams. Sometimes a coach might not like you. But I think, yeah, just continuing to work hard for years and years and years is really the key element to it. Um, Kira gave us a good rundown there of both of your achievements, but also included as well uh, the involvement you've had, Jack, for example, with sport at Trinity. Is that a different slant, you know, once you go into college? You know, it's serious, but there's a bit of fun as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think some of the guys on the team maybe like the fun more than the rugby. But yeah, it's, it's you know, DFC is a really good club. There's a really good atmosphere there. And, you know, I think although there's a big focus on enjoying it, like I think the guys know when it's time to switch on, they need to switch on and they work hard for an hour or two of training and then, can try bring it together on the weekends but yeah it's, it's a brilliant club and I really enjoyed my time there. Did it bring extra pressure because you were seen as the guy I'm sure who was meant to be leading the pack at all times and be that person who's in there with all the skill and stuff or basically once you're in that hallow of the dressing room you're all the same and you're all lads out having for for a bit of fun who are only serious when it's time to be serious or were you nearly seen to be the person who had to lead it? I think when you're playing you always want to play to the best of your ability and you know, there's probably not more pressure on you there because you're expected to be one of the better players than there is like when there'd be thousands of people watching your games. So wouldn't say I felt any extra pressure, no. I suppose somebody like yourself probably wouldn't feel it. Perhaps it is there subconsciously, but you mightn't even realise it. Um, Nicole, I think it's very interesting. We all know the advocacy you've done in recent years and there's always that discussion. And I know some athletes really rail against it. They say, you know, I'm just somebody who happens to be good at football or basketball. I'm not here to be a role model. Whereas other people say it's important that I'm a role model and that I exemplify good behavior and good practices for people who might be seeing me and potentially even mirroring me. And what do you think? Do you have that responsibility as a role model or is it something that particular athletes may choose or is it nearly thrust upon people? Yeah, I have a sort of, I kind of, I even I was chance to my parents about this a while ago, I kind of have this bit of an issue kind of with the term role model, the way I think it okay. is sometimes thrown around. Um, I think that like when it comes to talking about athletes as role models, I think it's often important to look at it more within kind of like the paradigm of sport and sort of like use it with caution. I think like the example that I always have is that like, Tiger Woods, for example, is a great role model in a golfing context, but like not necessarily in a in a wider life context. And you can point to like a lot of other sports people, um, like, like it's a Djokovic over COVID and, and things like that. And I think that like the kind of like influence should only spread, I think, you know, so far beyond, you know, particular athletes area of expertise. Um, but like having said that, I do think like we we kind of, as you introduced, like sport plays such a huge role um, in challenging like social and political issues and I think like athletes kind of I guess that role model function is I think more about sort of using you know his own experiences um, and their knowledge to to spread awareness and um, because like sport and uh, sports people are so valued and I'd say like almost platforms in today's society 
Um, so I think from that perspective, it's not not really about a responsibility, but I think it's an opportunity um, certainly to to use, I guess, some of that like platform for, for good, as it were. Yeah, it's it's interesting, Jack, isn't it? That we see a lot of people out there and they really they really hammer home sport and politics should not mix. And then others will say or sport and whatever the issue of the day should not mix. But that to me would imply that you're an unfeeling, unthinking person who just goes out and happens to play a particular game or sport or have a skill better than most people. And that would imply that athletes are the most one dimensional being in the world where the vast majority of us tend to have a few things that press our buttons or things you want to talk about. And you happen to have the, I suppose, the luxury of a platform to speak up on things. But do you sometimes feel that the responsibility is there or do you, does that even weigh on your head when you stick your head above the parapet to say things that are very important to lots of different people? Yeah, yes and no, I think. I mean, it's you, you mentioned it there, like, like athletes are real people you know, every day of the week, you, you just see them for 80 minutes on a Saturday or whatever. And most people judge that person entirely based on what they do over 80 minutes of, you know, however many minutes are in a week. And so I think you you give up a lot to be an elite athlete, like of your time, of commitments, all sorts of stuff. But then also just the fact that you are a public figure. So everything that you do is, it's there for the media to pick apart. So I think no one really has too much of responsibility to speak out on things, but if you, you you do have that platform, so if there's something you feel strongly about, I think, and you want to speak out about it, I think it's really important that you do, but it's not a responsibility per se, because, you know, athletes give up so much anyways that if they, if they want to take on something extra, then they can, but I don't think it's a responsibility. So when you, because I do remember when, you chose to come out yourself uh, it's not that long ago even I can only imagine you must have had mixed feelings before you did it or were you thinking about it for so long you were absolutely sure or did you kind of think oh god I've done it now do I need to sit back and wait for the reaction be it good bad or indifferent yeah I think I thought about it for a while and then when I decided I was going to do it I didn't really have any second thoughts I thought uh, whichever way it goes it goes that way and you know I'll I live my life after that but uh yeah so I I when I decided I was pretty pretty confident in doing it some would say that's quite brave ah uh, yeah sure whatever <laughs> way you want to see it <laughs> uh, like Nicole you're a little bit further down the road in your own advocacy when it comes to doing it publicly and um, we we all remember like some of the interviews you've done they were really heartfelt and I they can take a lot out of you as well in hindsight now I know Jack is kind of trying to brush off the brave title there, but in hindsight, when you look back, do you realize actually that was a really hard thing to do? Um, I think probably for for me, it was, it was not necessarily that it was less of a choice, but I think it was the year that we were making a documentary about um, uh, Blue Sisters, about the Dunn team in 2017, and that's when kind of I had kind of a, had a really bad year, and that obviously played a huge part in my interactions with like the management and and the team in general, and it was more that Mick. But when the manager said, like do, you, like, do you want to talk about it in this? And it was, I don't know, I didn't really, I guess I didn't see it as like a sort of a big thing to talk about in the documentary. And it was more kind of spiraled out of that. Um, and it certainly, like I felt, it would, I don't know, like it would almost be sort of disingenuous to not talk about it and be part of this. Because I guess like like Jack was alluding to the idea that like athletes are people, you don't lose, you know, you don't lose all your sensitivity and your emotions when you walk onto the pitch. Um, so it felt like kind of it would have been would have been I don't know I guess disingenuous is the best way to put it to not speak about it then and then I guess because I spoke about it then and there was um such a good reaction and like a positive reaction and I could see it had an impact then it was sort of easier to talk about it more um but it was less of a sort of I suppose measured decision that I made yeah. I don't know if either of you managed to catch the interview that um, David Goff did in the Sunday Independent this weekend with Joe Brawley. Now, I think that was the bravest part, to go into an interview with Joe Brawley and expect to come out smelling of roses at the end of it. That's what I'd be more afraid of. But he spoke about how when he was a young boy, he was walking past his local news agents in Slane and he saw there was a headline on the front page and it was Stephen Gately from Boyzone coming out as gay. And he brought it home and he, re and he hid it under his bed and he spoke about how this this interview kind of encapsulates exactly how I'm feeling and I'm terrified of it 
and he put it away and he still actually has that newspaper all these years later. And I found myself thinking how in the space of a generation, we've come a long way, but we're still at that point where people are doing interviews or people go, oh, wow, I didn't know that that's really brave. They're still quite different. But I think it's probably no harm maybe sometimes for us, Jack, to sit back and acknowledge how far we've actually come, even though there's a lot more to do. Yeah, definitely. You know, I I talked to a few of the guys at the Emerald Warriors, um, Dublin's uh, inclusive rugby club. And like, you know, they set that up a good few years ago. And just the work that they did then is so important for me because I wouldn't have had it so easy if they hadn't put in that work. And, you know, you look back at even 40 years ago, you know, things were completely different. And so I'm very thankful for the work that a lot of people did during those times, because without the work that they did, it, it wouldn't be as easy a place to come out to today. Would you agree with me when I say that it's probably still harder for men and males to come out in male dominated dressing rooms than it is for women? Yeah, without, without wanting to make a massive generalized statement, yeah. I'd say probably yeah because I think you see in in women's sport that there's a lot more out players which is which is great for a women's sport is probably men's the men's game needs to learn a few things from them why do you think that is considering how yeah. far we've come yeah it's, it's <laughs> hard one I, I I Nicole if you have any ideas to answer that one <laughs> no it's a tough one and I've, I've kind of been asked it before and I think it's I think it definitely, like I would agree with my Tasha, I think it's an incredibly brave thing for you to do because there is such, I think, still stigmatization to a large extent. And I think it ties in with like the study of masculinity and all these antiquated ideas. And I think maybe that's sort of what's holding back maybe people being so open um, within male sport um, and there just being greater acceptance. Um, and like to, to an extent, almost sort of expectation now in a lot of female sports, which just like <laughs> gone the other way, I'd say. <laughs> um, in general uh, moving away from those kind of sexuality questions and being that kind of role model even if you never even planned to be a role model you kind of ended up being that way or ending up being somebody who's at least using your voice for positive change there are leaders in this world in all different types of aspects even outside of sport and um, both of you it'd be very interesting to find out who are the leaders that you admire and what do you think makes them an inspiring and effective leader i'll throw that one to you first nicole um yeah it's kind of a tough one um i guess because my i don't know i'm gonna like i'm gonna be really evasive answer this question but i suppose like <laughs> the, the, the term leader even to me is really interesting because i suppose they're we kind of think of a leader as someone who's standing up making this big great speech like galvanizing the troops um, I suppose the way I would have experienced sort of key leaders and teams I've been part of or even, you know, in groups outside of teams like in a work context and things like that would have been less around sort of that like, you know, big kind of vocal figure but be more, you know, around someone who was like, you know, a very good communicator, like had a lot of like empathy and was sort of there, like spoke when sort of it was not necessary, but spoke when it was needed to rather than speaking because they feel they should speak. They spoke when there was something to be said. Um, so I think like sort of when I think about leaders, it's more about like people within my kind of teams um, that I kind of would have, I suppose that I would think of when you asked that question. Like, you know, obviously probably I'm sure like kind of more what you're gearing for is like someone, something like just saying that or or something or uh, something like that. And I think like obviously there's, <laughs> I would have no answers, but I think, yeah, it'd be more, Kind of at a personal level, um, I would look. I would have seen like what I would consider really good leaders because of the way they carried themselves and and not in a you know really loud vocal way. So what you're saying there is leaders are nearly people who walk the walk and do it and inspire you to walk with them rather than making a lot of noise about it and maybe mm. not particularly doing very much about it. Yeah, <laughs> actually. And yourself, Jack? Uh, I'd say I. Probably there'd be a few sports people I really admire, guys like LeBron, you know, who's obviously a fantastic basketball player, brilliant leader in his team, but also like he worked really hard to bring a lot of social change and you know, he used all the success he had in basketball to, you know, create loads of programs for to help kids in the black community. And that's brilliant. And then other guys, I 
gotten really into Formula One this year. So guys like Sebastian Vettel and Lewis Hamilton, who are always speaking out about social changes as well as being, you know, like phenomenal drivers. So I think it's, I, I know you touched on it earlier, like do athletes have that responsibility? I don't think they, they have to have it, but it, it's definitely nice when you see athletes standing up for, for social change. And can you remember just looking back when you were kids, because I know as children, we always, not even that we see them as leaders or role models, but you always kind of have this athlete that you think that would be so cool to be that person. Like when I was growing up, it was Sonia Sullivan. She was my thing, even though I was like, never going to be as tall enough, can't really run. But like in my childhood, that was the person, if you could be Sonia Sullivan, life would be great. When you were kids, who was your Sonia Sullivan? But mine was Sonia Sullivan. So really? Just, that's mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why? What was it about Sonia that captured you? Um, I think it was just because at that stage, it was so rare to see an Irish person at an international level competing um, and not just competing, but like excelling. And I think it's still like, I, I, I don't know, it's like, I don't think of myself as hugely patriotic, but it really comes through in sporting events. Like, like I'd nearly be in tears watching like the rowers win, even though I watch it once every four years or whatever. I think it's just, it was like someone who seemed like, you know, down, down to earth, was from Cork. Um, and was was excelling and I think as well probably the elements then I think was that it was it was really rare to see a female um sports person being held up and being not just not compared to being like equated to like the the male role models or not role models well male sort of like sports role models let's say that we, there would have been around that um, who was who was your Sonia Jack I feel a lot of pressure just to agree and say Sonia as well. <laughs> but uh, I have to say probably Paul O'Connell because, you know, played in the same position as me. He was one of the best in the world for such a long period when I was growing up. So uh, then when I got, he coached me at Irish under 20, so that was pretty cool. I think actually what's really cool as well, I asked my nephew the same question a few weeks ago and he's 12, actually a few months ago at this stage. And I said, who would you love to be when you grow up? And he said, oh, I can't say because I can't be that person. And I was like, why? He said, because I have to be a girl. And I said, who is it? And he said, Katie Taylor. And I was thinking like, wow, it just goes to show even by just doing what Nicole said, which is, you know, Katie never makes a lot of noise. She never makes a lot of waves. But when she speaks up, people listen and she does the work and she works hard. And that's it. And I find myself thinking, you saying to my nephew, but sure, it doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to be a boy or a girl to work really hard and to go and compete at the highest level. And then he was like, no, she'd really hurt me. <laughs> but I think it just goes to show how progress has come along that I think when we were children, no boy would ever think I want to, be, you know, they would never pick up of a woman to be there. They're the person that they love to be when they grow up. And I think, uh, Nicole, that kind of shows how when we talk about gender norms and stuff that shows we're evolving, even if we don't even think we are, you know. Yeah, I think as well. I went to um, I went to the Euros, the semi final and the final, the women's Euros this year, and it was brilliant to see. Like, even though England won, it was brilliant to see the final. Like that, it wasn't. I think often it's sort of like push that like if there's women's sport, it's like oh we'll get and like to be fair, the algebra do do a great job of doing it, but it's like oh we'll get all the little girls to go, and it was a like, genuinely less about it. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get over how mixed it was and how many like young boys that were there wearing like jerseys with women's names on them that like never would have happened in the past um I think that is like yeah it's more of a I think it's it's positive from obviously uh, young girls seeing you know sports people excelling that are female but also I think making sport less gendered I think um but like we all kind of know often like the default is is it, like is men's so if you say football everyone assumes men's football and you have to say women's football um which just is just the way it is and it's because you know how much more established those games are but it's great to see that starting to change and to see you know at like a very high level of seeing like money being put into women's sport which then is going to help it grow and that's an interesting point then to jump off and develop on jack because we spoke about the athletes roles and responsibilities whether they want them or not but then also the organizations i'm just thinking like clubs and sporting bodies like world rugby gaa do they have a responsibility to address social issues as well yeah, I think it's a funny one because obviously you look at an individual athletes and it's it's very easy for that person to say, this is who I am, this is what I believe in. But when it's a full organization, it's kind of harder to say, this is what we believe in. But I think there still is a responsibility for the organization to promote their sport. And if 
you know, t- to promote your sport, you want as many people as possible to be involved in it. So if you're excluding a group of people from your sport, you clearly don't really have the best interest of your sport at heart. So I think it's, you know, it, it is harder when it's an organization to say what that organization stands for, but I still think they need to be on the side of inclusivity. How do you think uh, sporting organizations in Ireland are doing in that respect at the moment, Nicole? Hmm. I thought that's kind of an interesting one because obviously it depends on you know, individual experiences on, on different sports. Um, I think it, it's definitely improved. I think there's, I think like like just said, this idea of like inclusivity and making everyone feel feel welcome within an organization. I think like you know Irish rugby um, and uh, the GA in particular have have clearly made strides to be more inclusive of, of kind of all groups um i think you know there's always more that can be done um to be honest and i do appreciate yeah it's that idea of like the an organization should maybe should reflect the values um that its members represent but as jack said it's very hard for you know to cover off everything um but i do think like that you know sport like functions as such a part of society and um, that like sporting organizations are really well placed um yeah to address like particular issues. Um, and I think, you know, like at a personal level, I would have been like privy to like say conversations when I was younger that were like weren't maybe as inclusive, but I like would think that maybe that's changing kind of as, you know, younger generations are coming up and they're being exposed to more of this mes- messaging and they're seeing inclusivity as um, something that's a given rather than something that's a threat to the, you know, existing like status quo. Yeah, it, it's, I suppose, Jack, you'd nearly say that just because, and again, sporting organizations might not realize the power they may potentially wield. And by giving this kind of support and being vocal and even just visible, visibility matters so much, that can actually have an impact then on vi- wider society. Because if you're being exposed to this from a very young age, it becomes your normal rather than, oh, this is a new thing we need to think about. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sorry, what's the question there? about how sporting organizations can have their role as well. The fact that, you know, when they're in, when they're implementing, you know, inclusive policies and encouraging, you know, inclusivity and not keep leaving anybody out and making everybody feel welcome, that that then drips down into wider society in a way unbeknownst to us where nobody feels, you know, lectured to, or, you know, that it's being, that's in any way scary. It's just normalized. Yeah, definitely. Cause I think, you know, the governing bodies of all sorts of sports, you know, their policies affect the clubs that, make up our communities and if there's a policy at the top it'll make its way down to the bottom and you know like me and Nicole started playing when we were four or five you didn't really have any opinions then what you experienced is probably what you've begun to believe so I think you know if what whatever the organization's policies are are definitely going to influence how people grow up and what they start to believe as they form opinions of the world. Uh, and just a reminder to the every, everyone uh, viewing this webinar, there is an opportunity to be putting in questions into the Q&A box, and we will come to them later in the programme. But just to remind yourselves, uh, if there's any burning questions you want to ask our guests, feel free to pop them in. So, Jack, just to build on that then, the way things are now, how do you think the landscape will look maybe in about 10 years' time? Yeah, I think it's hard to know because it's you know things have changed so much in the past 10 years and the 10 years before that. So it's hard to know, will things you know continue the same way will they speed up will they slow down I think I'd definitely be optimistic about the future of sport in Ireland anyways but it's hard to know until the time comes to pass I have to get your crystal ball out and see yeah. how that's going <laughs> who will win the rugby world cup <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, but you know we just discussed uh, sexuality and the barriers that can create if you're in an environment that's not supportive but I think something sport and athletes have done loads of great work in as well, even again, possibly unbeknownst to people by just sharing their story and being brave enough to do it is the area of mental health difficulties. And we all know the stigma that can go along with that. But like in recent years now, we've seen more and more athletes, some of them who know worldwide and like the gymnast Simone Biles. And obviously we saw Michael Phelps speak as well. And you're kind of thinking, what could possibly be wrong with those people? And Naomi Osaka as well, the tennis player speaking about the mental health challenges they faced. And Nicole, you were like a real role model for young people. Again, you probably didn't realize you were, you were just telling your story, but you were quite open and honest um, about issues that lots of people still find it very difficult to talk about. 
Um, and I suppose this might be a hard question to answer and there might possibly never be one particular point, but was there a particular moment that you realised anxiety was affecting, really adversely affecting every aspect in your life and kind of what was the catalyst to make you decide that it was time to do something about it? Uh, yeah, I think I probably, when I was younger, dealt with kind of like aspects of it, like a, a lot of social anxiety and um, things like that. But it was probably the sort of the, the catalyst of the old, it was probably just hitting, I suppose, rock bottom, not really having a, it wasn't really a, a choice that to deal with it. It was more it kind of left myself in a position where I had to deal with it, which was kind of back in, yeah, I'd say kind of really bad. It was back in like, like 2017, um, in which sort of, I guess it, it was kind of a, a perfect storm and um, like a bad year in terms of like personal life and like work was stressful and a relationship breakdown and kind of football then was like football always has been it's where it's always been like my escape but I think when you especially like if you're not if you're if you're not like Jack and you're not looking enough to get paid to play your sport you know you have to during the day you're kind of oh you're, no you dubs get loads of sponsorship yeah, you're yeah. practically <laughs> paid during the, yeah all those handouts yeah during the day you're like working and it's kind of a case where you then have to turn around after like say maybe a day where you've just like been holding together and then go to training and go into that like super high performance like field environment where there's not a lot of sort of space to be you know soft as it were um I think there was kind of got to a point in 2017 where there kind of really wasn't a, a choice um I kind of had to it all I kind of got to the extent where I sort of had to kind of just stop everything and, and re and restock um and then that's kind of when I probably realized that that's I had never had anxiety to that extent before and that's when I kind of realized what it was and then was I able to start trying to do it when you spoke out and told a few people you were struggling were they surprised or were they kind of relieved nearly that you'd actually opened up the door to talk to them um oh i don't know actually um i would imagine that my like my parents like my mom would have known that it wasn't going great um like a, a classic i think parents get the brunt of a lot of a lot of this um I still at home at that stage. Um, and I think what was really, I think the really the most positive thing from it, I think kind of points to the role um that like kind of sport managers and, and teammates can have. And that was more about like when I was kind of forced, forced really to open up to my manager because I couldn't go to, couldn't physically go to training, um, how supportive he was and how he didn't make it like it was almost the reaction wasn't like, oh, this is a big deal. It was like, okay, this is a situation and let's deal with it. And again, it was going back to I see you as a person, not a player. Um, which ultimately like, kind of the emotional well-being of, of players is based on the fact that they're a person that's one of the you know the best player in the world. Um, if they're not in a good place, like that's not going to translate onto the pitch. Yeah, there's a former All Ireland referee, Pat McEnany, you know, a lot of people be familiar with him, and he often describes it as it doesn't matter how good you are, if the computer up here isn't fully charged and minded, you're never going to be as good as you can be but I mean that's very easily said but we all know as well the computer can take a lot of work to fix the software sometimes as well you know and then especially when you you did a very good description there of just trying to balance it all and I think we're living in a world where we're all told we can have it all but sometimes Jack having it all just creates pressure and I think maybe we're finally learning as a species that we can maybe have it all at different times but we probably can't have it all all the time or we can end up really not in a good way. That's a very philosophical question there. Um, yeah, I suppose the, the 21st century certainly has a lot. I mean, you look at the fact that we're on Zoom talking to, I don't know how many people just from, Lots. I'm in England, across the water, like, yeah, so it's wild enough. I think there, there's certainly a lot going on every day. There's so much in your face all the time. It can be important to just, you know, step back from it all sometimes and I think the, the the human brain's probably wired to take a lot, but sometimes too much is on offer. Uh, I, yeah, I think you'd need a, a couple of philosophers to give a proper answer to that question. No, but. I think you're right. I think you picked up on something very good there about how the way the human brain is wired. And Nicole, you probably know this better than anyone. We're often wired to nearly focus on the bad instead of the good. Like I remember an interview Serena Williams did where she said she kind of regretted that whenever she won stuff was like great that's one move on to the next one whereas if she lost a, a final she'd be ruminating on it for weeks and months and she realized now when she looks back that she allowed the bad sometimes outweigh the good and I'm thinking when you were going through all this as well 
you were winning in all Ireland, the one you wanted for so long. I mean, that documentary just ca- encapsulated so wonderfully how much you all really wanted it. And you finally mm. got everything you wanted, but you still had all this going on. To use the word balance is probably strange, but did one nearly help the other one or did the anxiety and the mental health difficulties nearly take away some of the joy? Um, I guess kind of during, that, during that summer of, of 20, 20, 2017, when I'd step back from work and step back from football for a few weeks um, and sort of started balancing it out then. And then it was a case of that, like football then became a really like good supportive environment. Like I would have had a few like very, very good friends, particularly that year. Um, who would have been a support at training then and then training kind of we you know, I got back to a good enough place that training then was then about like just enjoying it and like performing. Um yeah, to the extent that like that's probably like one of my favorite, like my best memories on a football pitch is is winning that year because of everything that had gone into it, like both us losing the three Ireland before, but also like the year that it was, the fact that I was still on the pitch at the end of it, which like during that summer it didn't feel like a, you know that was going to be a possibility. Yeah, and to a lot of people in Crow Park that day, obviously they wouldn't have known the struggles you were going through. But what we did know was how you all as a team really struggled to get over that final barrier to the point that I remember I was in the press box that day and I was looking around and I was surrounded by people who were crying, like fans and supporters. I don't know if they were relatives of the players or whatever, but I could actually see a lot of people, the relief and the outpouring that came out. And I suppose in one sense, Nicole, you probably can never describe that feeling when that final whistle finally went. No, I don't think I'm quite eloquent enough um, to to to, the, to do that because it's it's one of it's actually one of the like kind of most vi- most visceral probably like like I can feel like what I felt like now because I remember standing I was standing I'd come off maybe five minutes ago and Macker who is my club mate I've known like I've played with my whole life um who's about three or four years older than me the two of us had come off and we hadn't even made it to the sole bench we were just standing on the sideline um because even though we were so far ahead like. You know, we're two of the survivors of a team that were nine points ahead with 15 minutes to go. So, like, until the final whistle goes, you can never really be totally sure. And I just remember just the like sheer ecstasy and, and joy. Um, and for like, you know, for days after, it was just, it was sitting there because we, we'd unfortunately had like, you know, three years of depression sessions, is what we call them. It, 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 it just took a few days for it even to sink in. Um, yeah, pretty memory. Yeah. Brilliant memory and such a privileged one to have. Jack, your best sporting memory so far. Have you had that day yet where you felt that rush of ecstasy and joy and you don't have words except your heart is beating out of your chest in the best possible way and you are just glowing? Uh, Probably not to the same extent as Nicole. I've had a few kind of finals losses and the likes. I think the the biggest competition I won was Celtic Cup. It was like an A-League. But I think we were kind of We'd won all the matches and then we, we, when we came to the final, it was, you know, it would have been pretty disappointing if we'd lost. So it was almost kind of on that, was it, sorry to say Serena or Venus Williams just n- didn't enjoy Serena it Serena was saying it, yeah. Yeah, it was probably like, it was definitely fun, but like it was almost when you put the expectation that you have to win it, it you probably don't enjoy it as much. Yeah, and Nicole, I'm just aware of the big question maybe people might have listening to this is, how do you go back? How did you go back to the well after the depression sessions, after Cork just wouldn't go away and they kept coming back year after year? And it didn't, it appeared it didn't matter what Dublin did. There was mm. always going to be something like it was, you know, I mean, tragedies are tragedies. They're sporting tragedies are not real tragedies, but you know what I mean? What was it that kept you coming back in January, February, December, training in the mm. mud? Like, what was it? What brought you back? Um, well, I think like, like ultimately I think the love of the sport, but I think as well is the fact that we lost like those three years, we lost by a point every single year. So it wasn't a case like we were going and we were getting absolutely trashed. And I felt like there was this like wide like chasm between our, you know, our team's abilities and theirs. That wasn't the case. Like we could have won each of those three years that we lost. So I think it was knowing that it was knowing that that like it was a it was a challenge, it was a puzzle that we had to solve, but like that we, you know, we had the ability and we had the team we had the talent to do it um, and then it was a sense that surely we have to eventually <laughs> ultimately like um, yeah. but no I think it was we knew we could beat them and it just took us a few years a few more years than it should have to, to put it all together and by god when you got there you held on to it to the point then you became yeah. you were the hunters for so long and then you became the hunted 
and not to rub salt into wounds, but Meads kind of figured you out there over the last few years. Um, it's a great time now for ladies football, isn't it? It's mm. wide open. Like there is probably six or seven counties who will say to themselves, we've a goal winning that. Mm. And you guys started that. Yeah, I think like, and obviously like, like I would be kind of very open and say like we obviously came off the back of a Cork team um, who were like, you know, the, the team of, of that generation um, who won whatever 10 or 11 or something ridiculous. So like, I think, yeah, there's a sense like no and no no team in any sport can remain dominant forever. And the, the more that you're winning, it's the more opportunity for the teams to, to see you play and to figure you out. Um, you know, we, we it was more for us, it was more sense of figuring our, our own systems out to be Cork. But I think in the case of me and you know Donegal this year, um, it was a case of you know building out a system and a, and a way of playing which countered the way we play. And like you know we don't agree with it. I think it's a nice way to play football, but ultimately like if your your ultimate goal is to win matches, again it's not something like I think the way you play is as important. But if your ultimate goal is to win matches, you know that's that's what you're gonna that's what you're gonna try and do. And like in all fairness to me, like they're they're two on the hop now, so you know it's worked. Yeah, that's what we were saying. Like, obviously, I was involved with Galway this year and we lost by a point to Meath in the last 15 seconds. And it just it ripped the heart out of me in a way that it hasn't for no, a long time with won. any team. It was, it was awful. And you're replaying yeah. it back in your head. And yeah. we were thinking of the depression sessions like you talk about. I remember leaving the ground in Tullamore and the thing that made it so bad was that Meath were so nice. They were just, they came in, they said all the right things, did all the right thing. They were just like, oh, it's the worst. But you know, it's really the worst now. We're going to move on to the quick fire out. I've already ruined some of it by asking you some of the questions already because I really wanted to know who your Sonia was. But for the viewers at home, I want you to know now this is the most serious section of this whole Q&A uh, that they have to think fast on their feet with the burning questions. Jack, I'm going to start to you first. Who has been your toughest opponent so far? Go. Well, uh, the Sharks from Durban. Why? They are enormous. <laughs> Good enough reason. Uh, Nicole, yourself? Uh, Cork. They're also enormous now. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the size of uh, Delisa Breeds Cork? She's tiny. <laughs> uh, but definitely Cork. Yeah, Cork were your mountain and you finally circumvented it. Right, next question. Rapid fire. This could shame both of you for deep eternity. What music do you listen to before a match, Nicole? <laughs> That's quite embarrassing. Like uh, UK, UK grime, like rap. Like I don't know why. I know. I know. Why? Like you don't know I why. Really you like it. I really like it. It's, it's become. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's quite funny because sometimes I like I like pull up to training and like my little Fiat five hundred with like you know Stormzy or like gigs going and they just like this hilarious. Like anyway, sorry that that's what wasn't a quick fire answer at all. You're telling on yourself there, Jack. What do you listen to before a game? <laughs> uh, Lincoln Park's Hybrid Theory, that album. Always Lincoln Park Hybrid Theory. You don't even diversify from Lincoln Park. No, just just Hybrid Theory. Oh my good god! Okay, <laughs> what are you looking forward to most this season, Jack? Uh, just playing more. You know, I've been involved in way more games way earlier in the season so far. So yeah, just playing more. Okay, Nicole, yourself, what are you most looking forward to this year? I know we're in downtime, and I know you're going to have some off time for a while. Uh, yeah, well, I'm actually getting my ACL reconstruction done tomorrow, so I'm going to be some off time for about nine months. So this season, <laughs> I'm going to look forward to get back on the pitch next year. That's that'll be my brilliant. That's a pretty good goal to have. Um, uh, next question, and this is a very serious one. Quickly, uh, best crack on the Dublin team. Sinead Goldrick. Why? She's hilarious and tapped. So you'd never think that she comes across as so serene and isn't. Um, Jack, who's the best? Who's the best crack on the Leinster team? Start oh, spilling the beans. Yeah, best best cracks a difficult one. Ty Furlong's probably the the craziest. He's he's a lunatic. Um, be lads who are diff different types of crack. But there, there's few jokers in there. Few different types of crack. That sounds like that's another podcast that we'll have to come back to and have a proper webinar and discuss the different types of crack in Leinster. <laughs> Actually, that sounds really bad. We'll delete that one altogether. And um, we'll move swiftly on speaking about the best kind of substance there is altogether. Tea. Barry's or lines? Nicole, go. Barry's. Oh, oh, that's the cork link coming in now, you see. Uh, Jack, Barry's or lines? Now I'm over in England. As long as it's Barry's or lines, I won't get that's true. They could give you PG tips and ruin your day completely. And now that you're in England, do you have a choice, Tato or King? I'd, I'd always be a, a Tato loyalist. 
would you? And yourself, Nicole? Neither, to be honest. Oh man, yeah. I, I liked you up to this point, and I'm thinking, God, the girl doesn't even like Taylor or King. Like, oh my God, you're just going down on my list of favorite people. Favorite place on Trinity's campus where you're not eating Tato or King sandwiches, Nicole? Where do you go? The path. <laughs> and yourself, Jack? Um, the Rose Garden. Oh my God, I thought one of you would have said the library. That'd be your favorite place. <laughs> and finally, in the quick far round, your best Trinity memory for both of you that you can share because we've already had swearing and just, uh, mentions toward crack. What can we actually share? <laughs> Um, probably winning the colours with Trinity. Yeah, that's a special one to have for sure. If that really does, that's really significant in Trinity and yourself, Nicole. Yeah, mine might be the same winning, um, not, not winning the colours, but winning the Giles Cup. Um, so the, champ the Division 2 Championship with the Trinity team in my final year. Yeah, you, you guys are really lucky to have those memories. That's not something every student has. We have some questions coming in here in the Q&A before we wrap up that I'm going to throw to you guys. And I know you're completely unprepared for these and I'm sure the audience will forgive you for that. Here's a question for both of you. And actually, I think it's a really good one. Um, both of you, do you have any thoughts on current issues around aggression, physical and online, against sports officials, be it GAA, rugby, FI, uh, FIFA, or uh, I've used my, my words, I'm saying IFA, they're, they're the farmers people, <laughs> over controversial decisions. Do you feel there is any way, any way to change this for the benefit of all involved in sports? Um, yeah, just on rugby, I think probably over the last 10 years, there's been a growing divide between what the fans and players and referees want from a game. So it's, it's quite frustrating because, you know, like rugby is a very difficult game to referee. You have to accept that referees will make mistakes like players do, but it can be frustrating when you know it's the same referees repeating the same mistakes every week. But seeing referees getting abused online, it's like that's not going to change everything, change anything. So I might probably draw the line there. I just think there needs to be a reform, whether they need to make the game easier to referee. But there, there's been a problem somewhere. But yeah, you, you can't be shouting at referees like it's, not going to help at all no it's funny though over the generations none of us have seemed to have learned this from management people in the stand that shouting at a referee isn't going to change a decision but do you think nicole it has kind of escalated either that or maybe it was always there but maybe thanks to social media we're finding out about these events do you feel there's any way that this can we could change it for the benefit of everyone involved especially referees because you know without them we ain't got no games yeah i think like jack leader said there is there is definitely sometimes um maybe worries about not even the quality of refereeing, but I think how like rules are implemented. I know personally, like for me, like in the LGFA, I think it's one of the biggest issues we have because it, it ruins the game. I think then it's easier for people to get annoyed um, and often like not understand the difference in the rules between like the GA and the LGFA. Um, I also think it, I'd say we're seeing more of it because of social media, but I also think maybe it's a case that there's a bit of like losing, I guess like in the moment it's hard because I we've all yelled at refs, but like I think losing I sort of I guess the oversight of the fact that it's it's a game and yeah, like like Jack said, there's gonna be mistakes made. Um I think ultimately that level of aggression, like the, the, you know, that ref and kind of Ross Ross Common or whatever, like you can't can't be decking someone in the head because I haven't given a free. Um yeah, how to deal with it. It's not gonna make them give you another one, is it? Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's the thing. And I know it's it's in the in the heat of the moment, it's very hard to sort of be able to take that rationale that like it's not gonna change. Like if you if I yell at the ref, he's not gonna change his decision. He or she isn't gonna change the way the, the decision went. Um, but in terms of addressing it, I think it's yeah, it has to be just really coming down like really strong on any of those sort of aggressors um and people that are leading it. Um, and to be fair to refs, like like they can't you, it's a it's their job the same as you know Jack's job like official job is very rugby and like in mine it is to play football that like if someone makes a mistake they're not trying to make a mistake um, and they, they can't people can't be in you know terrified of their lives as a result that's very true here is a really interesting question actually that's come in uh, from uh, a gentleman who was the captain of the athletics in Trinity in 1965. And this is probably a question of Pirate Unico. The first year when they had an, a girls' athletics team, 
women's sport in Ireland, as we've discussed, has come on exponentially since then. Do you think that this is leading, I suppose, opening doors to women being increasingly seen as contenders for top positions in Ireland generally? And he quotes here, in my day, Tony O'Reilly, as we all know, that great rugby player, he became the CEO of Heinz. Do you think, Nicole, that women's sport becoming more visible and perhaps giving women a bit more confidence and a bit more about themselves, that that will naturally lead to women in leadership positions in other sectors of Irish society? Um, interesting. Like, I think you'd see, yeah, I think it, it could be, the elements of it could be definitely, um, I suppose, being out, being comfortable working as part of a team and being vocal. Um, also, probably as elements of like opportunities. Um, I would now like say like a lot of, like yeah, obviously like Paul Flynn, like ex Dublin player, would have ended up as like um, CEO of the GPA and like crossed into the GAA as a result. Um, you know, I think it's more a case of opportunities connected to sport, definitely. Um, you know, getting a chance. Um, well, in general, I think. I think the kind of inclusivity or kind of more acceptance in sport is probably just being reflected in society as well. Well, we will look forward to seeing you in some highfalutin leadership role in future, you know, now that we know that um, you're open to the concept and you like the idea. Jack, here's, here's our question for you that I'm sure probably will be very easy for you to answer. Though you play for an English team at the moment, is it still the dream to play for Ireland at some point? Yeah, definitely. I, I don't know what my career holds for me, but can't see myself pull, pulling on an English jersey and singing God Save the King. So it w- wouldn't really interest me. But um, yeah, I'll have to see wh- where my career takes me. It would be lovely to play for Ireland one day. I'm telling you, that's a dream that most of us can never even aspire to. And the fact that you even still have that as a pathway, it makes puts you in a very rare cohort of people indeed. So hold on to it and cherish it. Um, another question here for you, Nicole. You've mentioned that your manager and coach, you spoke with them before and how they supported you. Would you ever consider, and I, this is why I'm throwing this one to you again, moving into a leadership role, maybe as a manager or a coach someday yourself, even if it wasn't corporate or business or politics, sports-wise, would you ever consider maybe becoming that coach or manager yourself? Uh, not really, to be honest. I think, uh, firstly, it's not uh, it's not something I've ever really desired to do. I'd much rather play the sport. Um, and I also think that, you know, good athletes don't necessarily translate over into good coaches um, or good managers. Like I know every so often we do like kind of coaching drills with like, you know, teams as part of, you know, various things. And I remember one time myself and Sinead Hearn, who also, well, could be a good manager, but definitely not a coach. Like hats ever trying to corral like about, I don't know, 50, like 10 year olds who weren't getting the concept of a simple training drill. And I was like, oh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be at this. Um, so like now I would say no, um, but I don't know, maybe in, you know, whenever my body finally gives up, maybe it'll be a way to, to stay connected to the sport. But no, I certainly have aspirations. No. That's that's a real political answer you're saying, oh, no, but you know, maybe well, I wouldn't say no, which is great. That's great news for everyone to hear. Finally, the last question for both of you, and I'll throw this to you first, Jack. What learnings can you or will you be able to take from high performance sports that you'll be able to use in your future career someday, whatever that is, because we all know um, rugby, while it's amazing to play professionally, it won't last forever. There will become a time you'll have to hang up the boots. What do you know from rugby that you'll be able to take into that life in the future? Very far away, of course. Yeah, hopefully a while away. Um, yeah, I think there's loads of lessons you can take. Obviously, just the importance of teamwork and being able to communicate effectively are valued everywhere. I think, you know, that determination that you need to get through so much rugby it can be very valuable you, you learn to problem solve you know like on the hop because you can't you can't wait till half time to change your game plan you need to problem solve in the moment so I think that there's loads of stuff you can take across it's you know I don't really know too much about what the working world requires for now anyways but uh, I, I, I imagine those skills are valuable in whatever you're doing hey look they still like require you to show up on time be ready to rock and roll and to have a good valid reason for not doing something if you're supposed to do it um nicole yourself what skills have you brought from sport or will you be bringing from sport into real world i suppose to use that phrase that Mm. you know that sport has given you that maybe perhaps others wouldn't have yeah i think similar to some of the qualities that jack called out like around i'd say communication is definitely a big one but also of like accountability um hard work is definitely something that kind of like a, a lot of what you do as an athlete is working you know it's, it's not as Jack said with the 80 minutes on a Saturday or you know for us the, the 60 would sound, sound so short but 60 you know 60 minutes on a Sunday like that's 
that's kind of almost like the time you get to, you do like that you, that's like you get to play whereas like it's the, the, the stuff you have to do that's not necessarily seen by everyone and um, whether it's in the gym or it's extra work um yeah that's a big one then probably like kind of respect and integrity I think the way that like teams I've been part of have held themselves I think you take that into how you deal with anyone regardless of the context if it's in a sporting context or a work context um that will take you very far well, you both have gone very far and I'm sure you're going to shoot way beyond the stars, whatever you both do in the future. Thank you so much for giving us your time. We always learn a lot from these webinars. You guys probably think, what do people have to hear from me? But what you don't realize is you are exceptional individuals and an hour spent in your time really helps normal people like me and um, kind of gives us a bit of inspiration and a bit of a reminder that sometimes life can be tough, but it can be a bit of crack as well, even if it is during a depression session where you're plotting the downfall of Cork or Jack is over trying not to sing God Save the King. Thank you so much for your time, both of you, Gurumila Mila Magri. All that leaves for me now to say is Gurumila Magri to everybody who tuned in and to hand over very quickly back to Kira, who has a final few words to say. Wow, thank you so much, Marcia, for leading such a thought-provoking and wonderful discussion. And thank you so much, Nicole and Jack, for being so generous with their time. And Nicole, I think we can all say good luck with your ACL surgery tomorrow. Um, and thank you so much for sharing all of your experience and insights and for being so honest with us. That was just such a fantastic discussion. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the alumni office and in Trinity Sport particularly Gillian Neely for making today's webinar possible. And thank you as well to everyone who joined us today and asked questions. It's so great to see you all here and have that engagement and enthusiasm. We hope that you'll join us again next month as Inspiring Ideas at Trinity welcomes Dr. Peter Crooks and Dr. Kieran Wallace from the Beyond 2022 project to share the story behind the remarkable restoration of the seven centuries of Irish records that were destroyed during the Irish Civil War and the creation of Ireland's virtual record treasury. Details on how to register for the next webinar will be sent via email and posted to social media in the coming weeks. If you have any questions or comments regarding this webinar series or any other questions you'd like to ask here in the alumni office, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. For now, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you'll join us again next month and good evening.